Welcome to Visions, a series of visits to almost everywhere. I'm your host and fellow traveler, Herb Malsman. We're in a doctor's office, uh, a simulated doctor's office. Uh, we are on the set of Unsolved Mysteries, a segment that's being shot for Unsolved Mysteries. Our tape date is August 6, 1994. Our location is the Belvedere Hotel, which is now condominiums uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. It is about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It is a Saturday. We're going to be spending the weekend on the set uh, of an Unsolved Mysteries. Uh, the story is about Dr. Frank Olson, a respected biochemist uh, during the Cold War, remember the Cold War, well, he mysteriously fell out of a window. Again, it was at the Statler Hotel in New York City, but I guess unions and parking and the way it is, uh, the Belvedere Hotel, uh, which is not condominiums, is the Statler Hotel in New York City. So let's get that straight. That's one mystery solved, how New York becomes uh, Baltimore. Uh, we are going to be uh, speaking with people on the production, perhaps get a couple of extras, maybe even interview a dead body uh, on Sunday a de from the dead body scene. I guess Dr. Frank Olson will try to get him. Uh, we'll be with the producer, Jeannie uh, O'Neill. So we're going to be spending the weekend uh, uh, covering this, uh, covering this uh, location shooting for Unsolved Mysteries. Okay, so uh, with that said, uh, I'm going to head towards a fade right now. And when we come back from the fade, we will be on location for Unsolved Mysteries. It is an NBC series, a fine NBC series, hosted by Robert Stack. So uh, with that said, let's head for the fade, and I'll see you beyond the fade. Opening up this segment of Visions is the producer of this uh, episode of Unsolved Mysteries, Jeannie O'Neill. Give us an overview of this segment, how it came together, and your uh, position with it, your job, and, uh, and um, set the scene for us. Nick Olson, who was a, a prominent biochemist, uh, was working for a branch of the CIA that was doing experiments into chemical warfare. And ten of these scientists that were working for the CIA were up uh, having a meeting that Frank Olson was holding at a mountain lodge. And one of the people there gave these scientists LSD without their permission, without their knowledge. And all of them reacted okay, except for this poor gentleman, Frank Olson, who had a really bad trip for nine days, at the end of which he was found dead outside his tenth-story hotel room window. And... The assumption is that he committed suicide because he was very distraught and, and he was very, you know, he was under duress from acting adversely to the drug. Um, however, if he did commit suicide, apparently the body went out head first, so he would have had to dove through a window and, and gone through the closed window and the window shade and the curtains, which is a pretty s strange way to commit suicide. Um, so that's essentially the beginning of the story. And then what happened in 75, the government issued a formal apology um, to the Olson family saying that they were sorry that they had contributed to his suicide. The most recent developments are that the body has been exhumed and uh, there's going to be some forensic tests performed on it to see if the body sustained any injuries prior to its crash. Okay, that was 1953. You're just getting a uh, beep now a, uh, a, a met, uh, to make a call. Uh, you beep or just beep. Uh, okay, that was 1953. This is 1994. Um, uh, what sort of a schedule did you have this weekend? Give us the shooting schedule and how this all how this all shapes up, and how you wind up here in Baltimore. It's been a, a pretty tough schedule. We try and schedule our shoot days to be 11-hour days. We do that for daylight, and also because it seems like shoot days always wind up being that long. So an eight-hour schedule really isn't realistic. So we try and schedule eight-hour shoot days. This is our fifth shooting day. Um, we started. We did one interview our first day, we did five interviews our second day, and then we've been doing recreations on days three, four, and five. And tonight will be day five, will be our, the last of our recreations. Who are the interviewees? Now, I know you have Eric Olson coming up uh, this evening. Right. Uh, this afternoon, who, who are the other uh, four or five interviewees? We've done Eric's brother, Nils Olson. Uh, uh, we also did a congressman, James Trafficant, who's going to be looking into this he it sounds like he has some connections in the CIA and he's doing his own investigation into this story um, we also interviewed um, the author of the search for the Manchurian candidate John Marks um, and let's see Nils Eric John Marks 
uh, Congressman Traficant, and we interviewed a gentleman named Armand Pastore, who was actually uh, the person to find the body. He was the night manager of the Statler Hotel in New York City, and he was the only one to see Frank Olson on the pavement before he expired. The author of uh, the search, I guess, the for the Manchurian for candidate, uh, the Manchurian candidate controversial when it came out because it came out about the time that John Kennedy was assassinated, uh, but it had to do with brainwashing of the Chinese, the Red Chinese. Uh, in that respect, it plugs into this story because of the brainwashing, the, the drugs? Uh, I, I, I haven't read the book. I'm sorry. I wish I could tell you. There's another Manchurian candidate with uh, Lawrence Harvey and uh, Angela Lansbury, a great film of Frank Sinatra. Uh, was about brainwashing, so I thought maybe the LSD plugged in. You mentioned uh, uh, Mr. Olson going out the window head first, and then the the window and the and the drapes. Uh, explain all that. And since there was no witness, how do we know he went out head first? And what makes that not a suicide, perhaps? I think the main thing is that if you've ever heard about a suicide of someone who jumps to their death. First of all, that's usually it. They usually jump feet first. They usually open the window, climb out on the ledge, or go up on the roof and jump off. In fact, here at this... Feet first. Right. And at this location that we're shooting at right now, as a matter of fact, not long ago, someone did just that. He ran off the ledge and kept going and, you know, plummeted to his death. Um, I think the way they know that he went out head first, I believe, is from... They did a very cursory autopsy uh, on the body at the time, and I think that's how they knew that he went out head first. You kind of shoot out a sequence. Uh, now, uh, yesterday being Saturday, uh, you shot the psychiatrist's office, the doctor's office, and then the uh, hotel scene, and then the operator, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, hotel operator, and I guess the call that was coming in from upstairs, that was from, uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, Frank Olson. And then, of course, that was shot at a sequence. I'm a little confused. Uh, the phone call he makes from his hotel room uh, the evening that he that he falls to his death, uh, that call was being shot earlier in the day. So you do shoot at a sequence. Right. The reason for that is there's so many factors that go into planning a shoot schedule. As you can see, for example, tonight I'll probably have 30 people on my set. And there's things to think about, such as daylight, such as location moves, um, and you, actors, what actors are on the set. When everybody's on a schedule, and you, you shoot your schedule out of sequence because sometimes it makes sense to keep everything in the same location and then move downstairs. So you try and do all your exteriors at once, all your interiors at once, where in real life something may have happened inside, then outside, then inside again. That's just not practical because each time you move 20 people and tons of equipment, you lose time in your day. So you try and make things as logistically smooth as possible. How did this story come to you specifically and how do you get your stories in general? I'm not entirely sure how this story in particular came to us. That might be a question you might ask the interviewee, Eric Olson. I'm not sure if we approached him from reading about it in our research or if he approached us. Uh, oftentimes, the viewers write in. We get thousands of letters a week. And the viewers are a great source of information for stories. People write in about their family stories or about something that happened in their hometown. We get great story ideas from viewers. We have a staff of about 12 researchers, and it's their job full-time to look for good stories stories and what they do is they call reporters across the country they read a lot of magazines read a lot of newspapers they call uh, police officers they call detectives and they scout for good story ideas and then they pitch them um, about every other week they have a pitch meeting where they toss out story ideas to the executive producers and see uh, see what the executives think is viable in the pre-interview you said occasionally you get stories uh, from the FBI or you deal with the FBI but they don't help you as much as they do America's most wanted uh, you, you want to fill us in or you want me to forget that question well no I just I, America's most wanted is a little bit more dimensional in than we are in that they do strictly fugitive stories where we as we cover stories that are anything that's conceivably a mystery whether it be a natural phenomena whether it be a missing person whether it be a fugitive um, a scientific kind of mystery and because of our broad scope we won't turn to the FBI quite as often as say America's most wanted probably will. Terry Troop uh, the lady in charge of wardrobe and uh, and getting all these folks dressed uh, just showed up uh, here on the set uh, outside the Hotel Belvedere and it reminds me what do you do with the clothing now uh, you've tracked down the clothing and the furniture and the period pieces what happens with all that when it's done with I've rented some costumes from California when it's hard to find period uniforms and here we have we have two uh, NYPD officers in this segment we also have a bellman and a doorman and those period uniforms we rent from a costumer in California 
California and I bring them back at the end of the shoot. Um, for some of the street clothes that we are using in the exterior scenes, we've purchased stuff at thrift stores. Thrift stores. And uh, so we now own those and can use them in future segments. Because I do like to bring uh, my listeners into the, uh, the making of this uh, series occasionally. Uh, we finished this uh, interview, this opening piece, and then I remembered something about going out head first, and you remembered a question. Have we covered everything now? Is there anything uh, you want to add? Or? No, not really. Not in particular. Okay, let's uh, let's head to the set. Okay, moving along, we're in the wardrobe department, and the wardrobe department is sort of a put together a room. It's between sets. Uh, we're between the doctor's office set and the bedroom set, the hotel uh, room set, and we are with Terry Troop, and she is a steam ironing right now. Uh, let's say hello to uh, Ms. Troop and uh, and find out just what's going on here today, and uh, get a look at her wardrobe department. and uh, And here we go, Terry Troop. Uh, Terry, what's going on? Good, good day, evening. Good morning. Good Good afternoon. What's happening here? It's hard to tell, isn't it? Because we're doing a night shoot, and so our morning starts at around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I'm right now slaving over a hot steamer, doing uh, steaming out a bellhop's uniform circa 1953. Uh, we have uh, brought in some, some wardrobe from California to replicate New York City police officers and bellhops and security guards from 1953. Uh, the scene that we're doing today, uh, originally uh, it was supposed to take place in New York City, and Baltimore duplicates New York City locales uh, very nicely. Uh, our hotel is serving as the ho uh, hotel room in New York City, where uh, our two main actors were staying, as well as the psychiatrist office and the uh, switchboard operator's uh, area, which is being set up right now in the lobby. And the sounds we're hearing right now are the steam coming through. Is that the, the sound we're getting? That's the sound of the steamer bubbling away. <laughs> kind of sounds like one of those infomercials, you know, that steamer. <laughs> uh, how do you go about now? Who does the research? I guess you do a lot of the research. Uh, how do you how do you come together with the with the uh, the clothing uh, that is circa in this case 1953? Uh, how does that come together? What sort of research goes into that? Uh, when I found out this was 1953, I keep research magazines at home, and I pulled out two or three magazines that were dated 1953. One of which is my favorite it has a, a big article on Audrey Hepburn when she was getting ready to make Sabrina Fair. So it's, it's easy when you're trying to do your work to get lost in the history of that time as you go through these uh, research periodicals. Um, very often the period is stretched a little bit. It may be 1953, but as we all know, when you go into your closet, the clothes that you have didn't all come out of 19 whatever your current year is. We have clothes that go back as far as 20 years, so there's a little bit of leeway with that. Also, you have to... Um, do the director's bidding. Whatever he wants is what we provide. And uh, we try to provide uh, uh, references and guidelines to help the director if, if he so wants it. Otherwise, we do what he likes. Uh, this production has given us um, it, it's, it's, a, it's done in a very short period of time. The pre production is done um, with, like in two days, for massive numbers of people. So it's, it's just physically hard to pull. The volume of clothes, shoes, hats, overcoats um, for all the characters and to get proper fitting. Uh, when you're in L.A. or New York, you have costume houses that you can walk into and pretty much pull your pick. When you're in a locale like Baltimore, um, we often have to go through uh, thrift stores, Goodwill stores, vintage clothing stores, our friends' closets, and... Um, that sort of thing. So it's it's a little more time consuming the way we do it on a local level. However, um, be because of the um, the time pressure, we did order our police uniforms and our bellhops from California because we could get those quickly and in period. Amazingly, the hotel is uh, here in Baltimore, which is not a hotel anymore. It's a condominium. Uh, some of the clothing came out of California, and all this to simulate New York City. And you're a Baltimorean. Uh, you're a native Baltimorean. Uh, did you just get uh, call for this particular job, or do you travel with Unsolved Mysteries? Are you are you in Unsolved Mysteries on a regular basis? I'm a freelancer. I've worked for Unsolved Mysteries with a different production team before, um, but uh, I work in the on the East Coast area, primarily in Baltimore, Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, a little historical uh, data on this hotel that might be interesting to you is that uh, this is Wallace Simpson's Simpson's old neighborhood, 
and there was a suite in this hotel where the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, Windsor used to stay when they came back to Baltimore. We're looking at police uniforms, we're looking at hats and uh, uh, shoes and uh, suits. Uh, the color is very important. Uh, you also have to match colors. You need an eye for color and uh, how everything looks, uh, uh, how everything looks uh, on the screen, uh, what goes into that. Um, it, that's an interesting question because the trend over the past few years has definitely been muted colors. They don't want anything to look brand new. Very often we buy new clothes and do what we call distressing. We have to wash them, we take sandpaper to them, uh, we to spray tips and streaks on them. We try to make new clothes look old so that it doesn't jump out. So all of our color palettes are generally muted and especially on a shoot like this. Uh, this has a little bit of a film noir feeling to it, so um, we, we want that kind of gritty feeling in the background. Um, and you can look at our palette here, and they're all deep, dark colors, mm -hmm. rich browns and grays and soft shades. Right. We're getting a buzz, and I guess it's from fluorescence. There's something happening here, folks, so I don't think it's the machine. I think it's just the, the, uh, where we're standing right now. Uh, do you do black and white as well? Yes, I was surprised that we were doing this in color. This is the sort of film that would normally be done in black and white because it enhances the feeling of a period piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's the difference between doing something in color and doing something in black and white? Uh, do you, uh, how does the color combinations, uh, uh, how does that plug in? I don't know what this buzz is from. I hope we don't I'm get gonna, it on the I'll screen. Turn, I'll turn uh, the steamer. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps it's the steamer. No, it isn't the same. Well, anyway, it's just going <laughs> to add to it. Um, is, what's the difference in production? Uh, what do you look for in black and white as opposed to color? Uh, that's a really good question. And it, again, it's, it depends on the DP, the director of photography. Mm -hmm. uh, because some directors of photography absolutely do not want white shirts or white blouses or, or white, especially if they're doing video, because it blows away. I mean, in other words, it blooms. It becomes too bright on screen. And other directors of photography will say, no, I can work with white. It doesn't bother me at all. So it depends on their approach and their, their style of lighting. Mm -hmm. um, so you can be trained by working with certain directors to, to reach for certain tones or to stay away from certain colors because they hate it. They don't want blacks. They don't want whites. They don't want extremes. They want mid-tones. And then the next director, you know, you work very hard and you say, okay, I won't have any whites or any blacks. And they say, oh, I want whites. I want blacks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So you're constantly trying to mind read and, and keep a low profile and keep your director of photography happy and your director happy and your producer happy. Okay, so now you look at it, you've been doing it for a while. We'll get your background in a moment. Now you've been doing this for a while, movies, and you talked about uh, the magic, uh, the background, what goes on that people don't see. So now you're going to look at this. I don't, I don't know what the edit is going to be. How often do you look at a, a piece you've done and say, gosh, I could have done this or I should have done that or really good? Are you ever totally satisfied with your, with your work when you look at it? Um, there's an awful lot that we don't get to see, actually, that we work on, um, surprisingly. It's, it sort of shocks you when you see a... I do mostly commercials, and when you see them pop up on the screen, you're sort of surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always a smile, because there's an infinite amount of detail that goes into... Thank you very much. There's an infinite amount of detail that goes into set dressing and propping in wardrobe uh, that never it really reads to the average viewer. Very often we're trying to please our clients. When a client spends a lot of money for a television commercial, for example, he wants to see the production value. He wants to know that you really have searched for the perfect glass and that there are 20 glasses there for him to choose from and he knows that he's got the best choices possible. And that goes straight through production on every detail on the set, things that you would never think about. They worry about shoes and socks and belts and everything that you would never see in a 30 second or 10 or 15 second commercial. Mm, they want to know it's there. Okay, a little quick background on you and then I'll get out of your way so you can continue steaming. My background is special education, early childhood. Uh, I thought I was going to be in social services. Um, I'm, I'm a late bloomer all the way around. I had gone back to college in my late 20s, and this was one of my part-time jobs that evolved. I was working with a still photographer. Um, there were no stylists in this area at the time, and he said I should become a stylist because I had a good eye. And at that time, I did everything. I did the food styling, I did the wardrobe, I did the propping, I did the craft services, I did it all. Uh, because if you work, that's, that's what you did. You did everything. So I'm from the old school where you pitch in and you help everyone. Today, our departments are much more delineated, and sometimes people get offended if you step over and try to help them carry a table through the doorway. Uh, that's props in your wardrobe. You don't touch their props. But in this area, 
uh, with our local productions, we do help each other, and it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. What's your favorite era? It's not the 90s or the 80s. Uh, is your favorite era like the 40s, 50s? The 40s are absolutely my favorite, the 30s and 40s. And uh, some of the Victorian wardrobe is, is very appealing to me. I ask you that because you have a 40s style about you. I'm much more, I have a lot of period dresses. I'm most comfortable in 40s dresses. I don't, I'm wearing jeans today because I knew it was going to be a rough day and a rough night. I'm going to be outside on the streets with mm -hmm. our dead man <laughs> tonight and it's going to be chilly. Mm -hmm. But I really like, uh, I like that period. I feel really good in it and I do relate to it. Right. Okay, I thank you very much. And uh, where do you go from here? What's your next uh, gig is over? You have already had set up or? Uh, yeah, I'm doing a, a multiple things this coming week. Uh, next week I'm doing a, a TV commercial that will take me all week. I'll be doing wardrobe and makeup on that for Sylvan Learning. Uh, this week I'm doing a couple of spots for a cable station in Washington, D.C. And I'm doing, um, you know, I don't even know what the client is that I'm doing on Thursday and Friday, but I know that we are doing multiple locations. It's what we call gun and run. You get in your car, you drive to the next location, you, you make somebody look good, you pop in the car, you go get another person on the street, and you interview them. Um, it's fun. It's hard work. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you also told me where to go for coffee, and it was really a great <laughs> container of coffee over at the deli. I thank you very much, and much continued success in the uh, in the bellhop pants. I guess look, you good? Are they finished now? <laughs> They're close to finished. I have to inspect them by the window, make sure we have no light in this room except for the window. So I'm worried about what's going to happen tonight. I guess the gaffers will bring in a light for us so we can see what we're doing. Okay, there's no light in here. Okay, so uh, I'll let you go back to your steaming now. Thank you very much, Terry. Thank you so much. It's been my, my pleasure. We are now down in the lobby of uh, the Belvedere Hotel, now condominiums. Uh, we're watching the setup. Uh, we have technicians. We have a camera on a dolly, I guess. We'll, we'll get the technical uh, terms for this. It's sort of like on tracks. It's a camera on tracks uh, with, on a car, a little dolly. And uh, with wheels, of course, they'll run up and down the track. And it's looking right into the coat room uh, area. The I guess it's going to be the office. It's going to be a simulated uh, office. Uh, so they're checking the dolly now and moving it up and down the tracks uh, to make sure uh, it's, uh, it goes from uh, looking straight into the window of the, of the uh, desk. Uh, and, of course, there's a gentleman uh, with the cameraman, and he's uh, moving it up and down the track. Uh, now they're moving it closer to the... Uh, closer to the, uh, the location that they're going to be shooting in, and uh, we'll get a look at that. Uh, right in front of us is uh, Jeannie O'Neill, the producer of the segment. She's kind of overseeing everything. You hear some opera going on. I don't know if that's part of uh, what, the, what the segment, uh, I don't know if that's on the segment, or that's just uh, general music here in the lobby. Uh, so everybody's kind of uh, watching. Uh, again, it's a beautiful day out today, um, and nice music too. It's a beautiful summer day, and we're just sort of watching the production. So that's what's happening right now here in the lobby of the Belvedere Condominiums. Terry uh, Tripp right now is, uh, is, or is a troop, I guess Terry Troop. Uh, the uh, wardrobe person uh, is checking out the, the actress, I guess actor, that's uh, going to be playing the, uh, the hotel operator. And uh, the hotel operator, she has a couple of period uh, uh, paperbacks with her, and she's dressed in the period. And uh, I guess she's getting ready to go on, and uh, we'll cover that a little bit. What we caught just now is a bit of conversation uh, between somebody in production, and we'll find out who that is, and the again, the lady that's playing the desk uh, operator, the hotel operator. I believe he asked her if uh, she smokes, and she says occasionally she'll have one, and I believe uh, she'll, she may be smoking for this, uh, for this segment, or appearing to smoke on the segment. Uh, we'll look into that. With a uh, wind at our back, maybe you can hear the breeze, this beautiful breeze uh, today. Uh, we're looking at an old-fashioned switchboard. Uh, the uh, switchboard operator, the hotel operator, again, on the, the lady playing the hotel operator, circa 1953, is learning the board a little bit. Uh, we're looking straight at the board. Up to the right is a, uh, is a dial for dialing numbers. She's practicing the dialing of the numbers now, and uh, she's been having it explained to her, uh, the, the switchboard setup, and she's picking up the phone, and 
getting used to it. She's got something plugged in over there. She's plugged in. Okay, so that's what's going on. We're just hearing some of the activity here. Uh, it's, uh, as we get closer to the shoot, I guess the, the, the noise increases a bit. We've been told uh, that we have to quiet down now. It's getting very quiet in the lobby. Uh, they have put uh, uh, blackout. Uh, they've blacked out the light from outside. Of course, this is uh, afternoon, and they're darkening up a little bit. They put, uh, they put some blackout uh, strips. Uh, boards up on the door and uh, we're going to try to uh, get some of this uh, background here so uh, the, here is uh, Life on the Set of Unsolved Mysteries you're listening to Divisions, a series of visits to almost everywhere. I'm your host and fellow traveler, Herb Malsman. Uh, I'm being quiet right now. We're kind of off about uh, probably about uh, 20 yards, 25 yards from uh, from the uh, the coat room that's serving as the uh, switchboard operator's uh, office or office. Um, there are four or five people looking into this little window. Uh, she's acting at this point. Uh, the camera is in there, the lights are up, and we've been asked to be quiet, and there's a child. Uh, I guess you can hear the child now. They're moving back on the dolly. They're moving away from the scene, and uh, there are three or four. It's interesting to uh, what you see, what, what is uh, uh, on television, is the, this lady working the switchboard, and just beyond her, a cameraman, a light man, a sound man with a boom microphone, and there's the child. Um, the noise of the child, now they're moving in again on the dolly, moving in, panning in, panning in, the camera coming up close to the window, and again there are four or five, uh, the producer, Jeannie O'Neill, is kind of watching on the fringe a little bit, and uh, life goes on right around the right around the chute, so that's what's happening in the lobby here at the over there. A little background on this uh, the shoot right now in the lobby for this uh, segment. Um, it is about 3.15 right now. It is a Saturday. It's August 6, 1994. It's a Saturday afternoon about 3 o'clock. Right now it's about 3.15. Uh, there is a wedding party coming in here at 3.30, so there'll be a lot of activity. And they'll be coming right through the lobby. So although it takes uh, forever some time to get a scene done, uh, they're down to about 10 minutes. The scene must be shot in the next 10 minutes before the wedding party comes in. So. Uh, that's the time restriction here right now in this shot. Okay, the rehearsal for this scene is over. It's only a matter of uh, perhaps uh, 40 seconds or 50 seconds. From what I hear, uh, the phone rings at the switchboard and uh, the, uh, the actress playing the uh, hotel opera says, may I help you? Uh, she gets the number and then she dials it. So they're in the process of doing the shot just now and uh, they've marked the floor along the, the tracks of the dolly so they know the positions. And just about in the middle of the scene, the, the 1994 phone rang at the desk, so I guess they're going to have to do that again. Uh, so they're setting it up. And uh, I'll see how close we can get to the action so you can hear some of this. I don't know how close we can get, so let's, uh, let's see what we can uh, get done over here. Okay, I guess they got the shot they wanted. Everybody's uh, pulling up stakes right now. The cameras, uh, the tracks, I guess, are going to be disassembled now. And the sound guys are setting up another camera. Um, I'm not this camera, I guess it is. 
lot of activity, a lot of sound, as you can hear. Again, you're listening to Visions, a series of visits to almost everywhere. I'm your host, Eric Malkman. We're in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, uh, tape date is uh, Saturday, August 6, 1994. We are covering a segment of Unsolved Mysteries, the fine, fine NBC uh, series uh, hosted by Robert Stack. Uh, the uh, segment is about a CIA cover-up that happened in 1953. Uh, the, uh, Frank Olson, a biochemist uh, in the Cold War, during the Cold War, he the biochemist, uh, went out a window at the Staten Hotel in New York City. We're upstairs now in uh, Suite 1005. Uh, there are a group of actors, mostly young men, uh, putting suits on, getting set. Uh, we have a gentleman here with a suit, very period, of course, uh, uh, for the... Uh, 40s and 50s, uh, waiting for his shoes and socks. Uh, Rosemary Noor, who played the uh, who played the uh, hotel operator, is up here now, turning in costume. Uh, and I want to get a Rosemary for a moment. Uh, Rosemary Noor, actress and switchboard operator, how'd that scene go? I, I, you'd have to ask the director. He's always the final source on something like this. How did you feel about it? Now you wear glasses. I was just I noticing you. Operating in the old-fashioned switchboard, it took me back to a time when operators actually were helpful instead of obstructive. So. I enjoyed that. Did you ever work a switchboard before? Uh, no, I never have. Okay. Now you wear glasses, but you're not. You're wearing your regular glasses now, but you're wearing period glasses now, white. Um, why not just wear your own? Because they aren't the right style for the 50s. Uh, in the 50s, glasses looked very different. And also, she doesn't wear them in the scene because they reflect from the lights. So, so there's no glass in them. Uh, give us your lines again, uh, because we really didn't catch them uh, from outside. What are your my, lines? My deathless line is, Operator, may I help you? And that was all that study for Operator, may I help you? And then you dialed the number. Were you a smoker at one time? You don't smoke anymore? No, I don't smoke. And I've never smoked Lucky Strikes, so that was a very interesting little... Um, yeah, I heard you say, well, only on occasion I've had a cigarette, not yeah, not really, but the smoke was going, and I guess the, the operator was smoke. my birthday. I allow myself one on my birthday, one on my anniversary, and one for Christmas. Right. Okay, why did they have to have a cigarette going for this? Because it's in the 50s, and everybody smoked in the 50s. What we're listening to now is the director, and I believe his name is Bob Wise. He is uh, discussing the, the, the uh, roles in the scene with the two actors, the doctor, and Frank Olson. Let's try to eavesdrop.